Hi there. My name is Dave Seaweed, and I'm the Indigenous Coordinator at Douglas College. I am from the Kwakutl Nation, born and raised in East Vancouver. My father and his father before him are from Port Hardy in Alert Bay. I would like to acknowledge that I'm sharing with you today on the Kakite First Nation, which is the newest minster band. And thank, thank you, Ronald Larrabee, Ronald Larrabee, for supporting, for supporting our work at, our Douglas, work at College. Douglas College. As is my As understanding, is the word Vancouver Festival spread throughout the Lower Mainland and Fraser Valley and online throughout North America and beyond. I would also acknowledge the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, Kwantlen, Katsi, and Quiquitlam nations. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, where we live, we learn, we play, and we do our work. 95% of British Columbia, including Vancouver, is on unceded traditional First Nations territory. Unceded means that First Nations people never ceded or legally signed away their lands or gave them away to the Crown or to Canada. I have been asked why we acknowledge First Nations territory. Many organizations, governments, and school districts have adopted the practice of acknowledging traditional territories as a way to honor and show respect to the Aboriginal inhabitants of this land, the First Peoples. This practice enables wider municipal communities to share in Aboriginal cultures and leads to better relationships and understandings. Observing this practice connects participants with the traditional territory and provides a welcoming atmosphere to the land where people are gathering. We believe that acknowledging territory is a positive step towards reconciliation, which involves a commitment to learning about and understanding the real history of Canada's Aboriginal peoples and taking responsibility for reconciliation with Aboriginal peoples in Canada. The process of reconciliation is tied to the federal government's relationship with Indigenous peoples. The term has come to describe attempts made by individuals and institutions to raise awareness about colonization and its ongoing effects on Indigenous peoples. I would encourage you all, young and old, to do a little research about where you live, work, or go to school, and in turn, find out what First Nations territory you are on so you can acknowledge when asked or for sharing at events. I wanted to conclude by mentioning the September 30th national holiday that began last year as National Day for Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th. In First Nations communities, we have been honoring Orange Shirt Day since 2013. The origins for the day come from a story about Phyllis Webstad's experience. She went to the mission for one school year in 73 and 74. She had just turned six years old and lived with her grandmother on the Dog Creek Reserve. They never had very much money, but somehow her grandmother managed to buy her a new outfit to go to the mission school. She remembers going to the store, picking out a shiny orange shirt. It had string laced up in front and was so bright and exciting, just like she felt to be going on to school. When she got to the mission, they took away her clothes, including the orange shirt. She never wore it again. She didn't understand why they wouldn't give it back to her. The color orange has always reminded her of that and how her feelings didn't matter, how no one cared and how she felt like she was worth nothing. All of the little children were crying and nobody cared. We now wear orange shirts that always say every child matters. I would encourage you all to wear orange shirts on September 30th and become an ally and partner for First Nations folks dealing with the residential school findings. I'm wishing you all the best during your time with Word Vancouver 2022. Stay strong and stay safe. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody. I'm Brad Morden. Uh, welcome to Speaking to the Page. We have um, three incredible authors tonight from Right Bloody North. We have R.C. Wislowski, Lucia Mish, and Brandon Wint. Um, before we get to that, we have some big thank yous to send out to all the people who have helped make this festival possible. Uh, we're in Vancouver. would like to take a moment to thank our generous donors and sponsors. We would like to give a special thank you to SFU and the Writers Studio for this wonderful space and their continued generous support of Word Vancouver. 
the Canada Arts Council, the Canada Book Fund, the Canada Heritage Fund, Canada Periodical Fund, the BC Arts Council, BC Gaming, Creative BC, the City of Vancouver, DBVIA, the Yosef Wosk Family Foundation, the Hamber Foundation, the BC and Yukon Books Book Prizes, the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, uh, CWILL, I mean, that's Quill, Pace and Associates, the Crime Writers Association, the Federation of BC Writers, the Surrey Library, the Vancouver Li Public Library, the League of Canadian Poets, the Writers Union of Canada, the Vines Festival, and many more. For a full list of our partners, please visit our website. Without you, this free festival could not happen. If you haven't already, please consider making a donation via our website or a link, which you might be able to see over in your chat. Ah, uh, there we go. Uh, let me bring you all back here. So um, yeah, I'm gonna be your host for the evening. My name is Brad Morden. I'm the, the publisher of Right Bloody North. And it's my distinct honor to host this event and to, to work with um, the authors that you're gonna hear tonight. Um, you know, we have we only have an hour here, so we are gonna jump right in. Our very first reader this evening is gonna be R.C. Weslowski. R.C. Weslowski is the 2021 Zacchaeus Jackson Nice Memorial Award winner, the 2016 Sherry D. Wilson Golden Beret Award winner. R.C. is a two-time World Cup of Poetry Slam finalist and co-hosts the radio program Wax Poetic on Co-op Radio for over 20 years. R.C. is the Artistic Director of Hullah Blue, the BC Youth Spoken Word Festival. R.C.'s first collection of poetry, My Soft Response to the Wars, is available now from Right Bloody North Publishing. You can get this at rightbloodynorth.ca. Uh, put your virtual hands together for the one and only R.C. Weslowski. I'll put my real I'm hands real. together. <laughs> uh, I can hear myself there. Okay, it's I gone. Can you. Uh, good. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction by our uh, Indigenous host as well. Everybody has a sound. Everybody. Everybody, everybody has a sound. Everybody, everybody. I believe we are all songs getting inside of each other. And I can feel you now, before me, after me, all around, getting inside of me. And it is beautiful. My bones are filled with the sounds of the rhinoceros grief of living, the cries from the bodies filled with disease, dying of neglect, of being taken for granted, the bodies abused by commerce, by power, by war, the bodies that resonate with the disgust of eels at how callous we've become with our sexuality. These songs fill me, and I can feel my body grow tired and weak as a rag soaked in blood, the blood of all those who've come before and come undone, trying to deny gravity its throne. A battle infused with folly, as eventually we all succumb to the inevitable entropy of unusurpable death, begging for one last breath. One more song. I will not die tonight. I will not die tonight. I will not die tonight. Oh, sad crowd. Sad, magical, fantastical, elastical, madrigal crowd. Climb the moist corduroy vine and bring lightning music for friend. Ring the bells, sanctify your hearts with song. Lightning and music, thunder and trombones will reveal who you are. 
Do not be an unknowing minstrel. The universe is a symphony conducting itself beyond the intellect into our hearts, asking only that we sing, dance, and be loved. Everybody has a sound. Everybody, everybody, everybody has a sound. Everybody, everybody. That's the first poem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there you go. Thank you. That's the first poem. I'm going to do a poem for Zacchaeus Jackson. Nice. This is the poem that I wrote for him in the book, My Soft Response to the Wars. Very powerful poet, very powerful person, important person uh, to many people. Everyone whose path he crossed, um, they remember him. This is called Casa Supernova. You were an adventurosaurus, the only dinosaur never killed by that legendary meteorus, a survivor, a sojourner, traveling the world, telling your tall tales of truth to any youth who would listen. And man, did they listen with rapture and awe to all those words that could thaw the coldest, most cynical hearts. You were invincible a transformer, a natural performer, a Blackfoot alchemist, taking the darkness that found you, how profound you becoming a casa supernova, sun bursting us with your beauty. It's hard to believe now that you're dead. I can't wrap my heart or my head around it. It doesn't seem possible that anything in this world could ever beat you. When I heard the news, I thought you died wrestling an alligator or a saber-toothed tiger. Maybe you were crushed by a heavy cookie or pushed off a cliff by a mastodon or challenged to battle by Ogopogo. And it was one of those legendary duels that laid waste to the landscape like Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla. But instead of dying, you rose triumphant. And when it was over, Ogopogo like so many others before them, became your best friend and family because you knew your family can never be too big. And if you make enough friends in this life, well, you'll never die. But I suppose it makes sense that if it had to happen for you to leave this mortal coil, it would take a motherfucking train to kill you. Casa Supernova, indeed, he was. Um, this poem, next poem, uh, requires me jumping around, but I'm not going to do that uh, because I'm in a chair and I don't want to jump around. But imagine that I am jumping around. I'm just checking, making sure I should have checked earlier. But I'm I, anyway. I've done a I've done a check. I've done a thing, and it's good. Um, glad to be here. Oh, by the way. Uh, I'm involved in a show called Mashed Poetics. For those of you uh, watching and uh, living in the Vancouver region of Turtle Island, the colonial name of uh, Vancouver, um, we are hosting a show called Mashed Poetics at Lana Luz this coming Thursday, the 29th of September. Mashed Poetics is a show where myself and Spilius the Ridiculous One put together a program where we pick a music album and then we get poets to write new poems based on the songs on the album. And we have a live band performing all the songs. So the poets are performing in between the songs. So it's a great um, oral audio experience where you've got all this noise, all this racket, and then whoosh, silence. Everybody shuts up and listens to the poets. And then boom, it explodes again with noise and raucous activity. And so this coming uh, Thursday at Lana Luz, September 29th, uh, show starts at 8.30. You can get tickets at the door. We're going to be doing the album, Nevermind the Bullocks, 
Here's the Sex Pistols. Yeah, that album. Uh, we figured. I mean, we already had a plan long ago, uh, but we asked uh, Queen Elizabeth if she would die to help promote it. And she said, yeah, okay, I will. And um, I mean, she was going to be, you know, leaving this mortal coil as um, anyway, and so she said, "Yeah, I'll help. I'll help you. I'll help promote your your show um, because there's that song, of course, God Save the Queen, uh, the fascist regime. Uh, great lyric. Um, so yeah, you can come sing along. You can pogo at the show, Lana Lose this Thursday. Uh, doors at eight. Show around eight thirty or so. Okay, be great to see you there. Um, cool. Uh, yeah. What else? Oh yeah, because." Um, you know, I try to keep things uh, topical, to, well, not necessarily topical, but just current as to what's going on. Uh, in Vancouver, there's this event called the Pacific National Exhibition, or the PNE, and it happens every summer, the last two weeks of August. And so we just had it, it just wrapped up about a month ago. And I love the PE. Um, uh, lots of people, it's, it's, for some, it's just too kitschy, it's uh, too quaint, but I think I, that's part of why I like it because of all the, the goofiness. You can go see concerts. I saw Cake at the, at the fairgrounds there. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is a poem I wrote in the book, My Soft Response to the Wars, um, called p &E Love Affair, True Story, based on a true story, as all stories are, as life is. Life is based on a true story. Um, and so yeah, it's called p &E Love Affair. We met in the pirate ship shadow, waiting for the rickety, rackety, clickety, clackety tracks of the roly poly roller coaster to rumble down our spines. You were feeding those tiny donuts to the super dogs while they were on smoke break, and I was voiding where prohibited after one too many lemonades. You noticed a cigarette butt in my urine trail and remarked, hmm, I used to smoke too. It was all demolition derby after that. We made love between the dumpsters like two animals on the endangered species list trying to keep themselves alive. You French kissed like a bullwhip. Your smile a death row mirage. Your legs were scissors I wanted to run with. Thirty years later, I know I should have gotten that tattoo because I just can't remember your name. But it was memorable enough. I wrote a poem about it. I think that's pretty good. Um, yeah, what else should I do? Oh, yes, I was thinking, I wanted to just do a bit of a PSA. Um, lots of people, uh, governments especially, are so oh, the pandemic is over. Oh, <laughs> we've beat COVID, way to go. Um, that's not the case. Uh, I saw uh, uh, a bit of a report, not the whole thing, a bit of a report saying that more people per day are dying now, this year in 2022, than uh, last year at this time or the first year of the pandemic. But governments are kind of like, hey, nobody's really paying attention. Um, it's over. It's over. Uh, get your booster. That's it. That's all you need to do. It's over. Uh, don't wear any masks in schools. It's over. So, but but some people disagree with that. They do not, they think, yeah, it is, it's over, it's gone. And so people are still arguing. People are still fighting and, you know, getting into, some, I don't know, hopefully not fisticuffs, but getting into uh, brouhaha's and bars and kitchen tables. And and uh, so my PSA, my advice is that if there is still tension between you and your friends, you and your family, uh, or friends and family, or however, you know, with strangers on the street, hopefully you have not been any victims of some sort of uh, random attack. Oh God, I hate that when that happens to folks. Um, but if uh, you have an opportunity to discuss and you're trying to convince somebody, don't, don't try to convince anybody of anything they don't want to be convinced of, but uh, maybe you can explain how it is. You can just say, it's like this. It's like this. Please just, just think of it. It's like this, that you can say to them, I think it's a good idea to wear a turnip on my head. It keeps me safe from double standards and tear away leather pants. Plus, I like how wearing turnips on my head makes me feel sleazy. You think it's a bad idea to wear a turnip on your head. It makes you feel ephemeral. You don't want anyone telling you what to do. Plus, turnip farmers are controlled by Bill Gates's left nipple. That one that feeds turnips, that the one he feeds turnips to in an underground bunker 
and near Sacramento. You probably think I've been brainwashed by a chicken. I think you're a mass murderer who wants my grandmother to explode. You say you don't believe in explosives. I say I don't believe in popping your peas. You say you'll never wear a turnip on your head. But you'll brush your teeth with dishwasher soap and tell everyone their pants are full of quicksand. As an act of good faith, though, I replace my turnip with your diatribe and a box of dead shoelaces. The next morning, I end up puking cardigans at a bus stop while a gorilla plays taintball with my waffle. I take my motorcade and immolate your humpback. You chalk snort my daisies and spit on my owl. I get drunk on ivermectin tequila and curse the wolves in your pantry. You brandish my hangover with a pap smear and ask, why were we fighting in the first place? Who knows? Doesn't matter. What matters is that we hate each other and buy shares in corporate turnip stocks. Someone's got to get rich from all this bullshit. That's my PSA. Um, yeah, I, I, and now I just realized too that I was gonna said I was gonna do this jumping around thing. I didn't want to, and I totally forgot, like slipped out of my mind. And uh, that's okay because I don't have time to do that. I have time probably for one more short poem, and uh, so that is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna read one more short poem, and I'm just gonna kind of. And this is that's another um, poem from my book. My book. Thank you to Brad Morden. And uh, Right Bloody North Publishing, rightbloodynorth.ca, my soft response to the wars. Um, you're going to get a treat by listening to a couple other poets from this um, publishing house, Lucia Mish, Brandon Went. Of course, that's why you're here. Hopefully, that's why you're here. And again, if you are in uh, Vancouver, the area colonially, colonially known as Vancouver, uh, myself and Brandon will be at Word Vancouver live and in person at the Right Bloody North Publishing table so you can pick up a book there if you want if you don't want to do it online and all that so it's called 50 is the new 50 and this is for my friend robert addison whose birthday it is today i wrote this for him and performed it for him eight years ago on this day and i'm performing it and dedicating it to him now 50 is the new 50 is the new ranch dressing is the old white supremacy on the new anti-social media is the new u2 album is the old Irish hate. 50 is the new cultural appropriation is my culture. Is the new standing rock taking a wounded knee during the old national anthem. 50 is the new muscle flexing ingredient used to invade the Ukraine. 50 is a new Chuck Norris movie made with 38% more genetically modified Bruce Lee. The new government surveillance, the new conservative tendencies, the next corporate merger, 50 is the old downsizing sing-along, the new diabetic severance package, the new old dogs, new tricks, HR bullshit, 50 is the new franchise opportunity in the old Michael J. Fox Sumerian reach around. The new I can't believe what's happening, the old world solar flare, French kissing the stock exchange, 50 is a new grave digger yelling at the old tomorrow today with a glow in the dark chest module pumping the blood of time through our veins. My name is R.C. Weslowski. Thank you very much for having me as part of Word Vancouver. You can find me on Twitter and Facebook. That's it. That's all of oh, LinkedIn, but I'm not. Uh, who goes on LinkedIn. I return you now back to Brad Morden, your host. RC, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was a great, that was great. Um, I do encourage everybody to go check out MASH Poetics. It is always a really, really incredible time. Um, yeah, coming up next, coming up next, we have the one and only Lucia Mish. Lucia Mish is a writer, performer, and facilitator from unseated uh, Musqueam Olin land. Their poetry has appeared on hundreds of stages from historic theaters to high school auditoriums and published in journals, including ARC and Room magazine. Lucia's first collection, The Problem with Solitaire, was released in 2020. As a teaching artist, Lucia is committed to helping others, especially youth, inhabit their personal and political power through creative expression. Lucia lives and works on unceded Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil territory. Put your virtual hands together for Lucia Mish. Hi, thank you so, so much. <laughs> um, and thank you to RC for opening us up with such a wonderful set of poems. 
It also gave me the opportunity to figure out which poems I was going to read. I will admit that I did not. I was like, I'm just going to wing it this time. And then I was listening to R.C. and I was like, actually, I'm just going to do, I'm going to match R.C.'s poems and put mine in conversation with his. Um, and so uh, I was listening and thinking about ways in which um, my writing and his writing share some themes and crossovers. Uh, and uh, and that's how I decided which poems I'm going to uh, read for you today, um, which I'm very, very grateful to have the opportunity to do um, here from my home, which is on, yeah, unceded Musqueam, Squam um, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish land, um, and further back from another home on Wekma Ohlone territory, which is in California, as it's colonially known. So various travels have been made, as I'm sure is the case for all of you to get here tonight. And I'm really glad that we're all here. And let's read some poetry. Um, R.C. started us off with a pretty incredible piece about body um, and voice. Uh, and ideally, I would respond to this by using my body as a voice and giving you guys a little dance recital. But I'm not going to do that <laughs> because that is not my wheelhouse. So instead, I'll read a couple of poems um, that, that R.C.'s wonderful work brought up for me. The first is called, I am worried that the answers I was born with have long since rubbed away. I'm also going to remember to start my timer because I am not good at keeping track of time and I lost my watch. I am worried that the answers I was born with have long since rubbed away. If there is a new place on this body, an undiscovered patch of skin concealed somewhere on my surface as yet unhandled, I would like it to show itself now. I've turned keys under my tongue and combed my scalp for passageways. I wrote open sesame on the mirror Tried unfamiliar tricks, hoping to scrape a knee I never had, but all I've done is scour the familiar sore. Maybe this place waits, like Brigadoon, emerges from my mist once every hundred years, hoping no hunters stumble past. Maybe there's a spell I have to say perfectly to make it appear. Maybe this is it, the plea that will produce the kept secret, the wardrobe my questions can climb through into the hidden realm, where I'm complete as a snowfall that no one has yet woken up under. We're going to stay on this theme for a couple more poems. This one is called What I Took From My Mother. A name, my second middle or my first last. A distaste for underwires and a light blue bra when she was done with it. The habit of arranging small objects into altars, readying every room for an offering a long-necked ease with earrings, a list of nevers. Let your host do the dishes. Forget to write a thank you note. Use soap on the wooden bowl or metal on the Teflon. Stay with a man who hits you. No matter if your best necklace is on the nightstand, no matter if every coat you own is hung in his closet, no matter what he says, it will never only happen once. Bad vision. Swimming lessons, her youngest daughter. I'm sorry, I meant to be more careful, but left too many pieces of that girl in places I'd been warned not to return to. And while that poem leaves us with pieces scattered, I also uh, want to tell a little bit of the story of gathering them back together. This next poem is called In Tender. You decide at first to be brazen, a different kind of girl, tits out to prove you've got no place to carry an apology, peeing in the alley behind the bank in broad daylight, yelling across the bar table how everyone should learn to put on condoms with our mouths, the way you'd say we should all know how to change a tire. It's choice, not instinct, to spit shame back at any eyes it can sting, to act unembarrassed while you still are, and as you strip and piss and shout, sure, you'll never actually feel the way you behave about your breasts and leg hair, the wet spot and smell of blood streaked on stomach. You become, in quiet, one of your own naked beliefs. Thank you. Um, next up, R.C. did a poem. Uh, 
in honor of Zacchaeus Jackson Nice, um, who also very much impacted my life um, and, and whose death impacted my life and my understanding of the coming and going um, that, is, that is an intrinsic part of existing. Uh, this next piece is called Throw Out Bearing, Drop Pocket, and How It Maybe Happens. One, your broken wrist. You were driving a screw, let's say into concrete, inch and a half galvanized sturdy shank. The drill in your hand transferred the motor spin into the threads of the fastener, kissed torque from trigger to chuck to bit to spiral tip. Your drill, wedding gift from an older brother, that one you managed to hold on to by hiding it behind the cans of paint thinner during the divorce, had no clutch, no mechanism to sense resistance, choke when the threshold was reached. So when the head of that screw landed smack snug in the cement and the motor's power met the immovable, all its will bounced back into the tool, throwing the handle counterclockwise with the full fury of the thwarted, and you, being you, were holding on too tight. So your wrist splintered like a sheath of dry pasta twisted between two fists. Now pain brazes your arm. When you open pickle jars, the Macarena has become an agony. Two, your flattened thumbnail. So you were shooting pool, let's say at the Legion, and like anybody who has spent hours of irretrievable youth learning to slip movement from wrist to stick to ball to ball to pocket, you know the candied pleasure of the perfect shot, the satisfaction smack black planet darting away to drop clean in a corner. So you bent, lined her up, gave it a couple test thrusts and drove the cue as if to skewer that ball. And then you, being you, turned, leaned on the edge of the table, so sure that you'd hear the smite the sink, but you missed. And that ball, heavy as $8 in quarters, met the edge at its own angle and came careening back, found your thumb against the felt lip. And all its speed was bequeathed into your flesh, shook your vessels till they burst like James Brown's heart on stage, pushed their guts up against your thumbnail, collapsed against it in their torn purple suits. Now your nail bed is filling with blood, pressure building under its plum and motor oil bruise. Three, you're unmourned dead. Hit by a train, say, taken by tumor, pulled through a planer of pain on the 12th floor of a downtown hospital, overdosed in Palo Alto on a bedroom floor, immovable, now your heart grand marshals the parade of the clobbered, liver limps to bring up the rear. Your bronchioles keep dropping the baton and your hands have ducked out of the marching band to go puke in an alley. That torment in your wrist, that throb in your finger, that grief you feel dicing the tender inside of your elbow and sliding its hunting knife between your toes. It is the recoil of power caught in your body. Thank you. Um, please feel free to use the comments section um, to connect with each other as we're reading. Um, it's uh, it's always a little strange to know there's that we're together and not be able to have that sensory experience. Um, so you know, no pressure, <laughs> but um, I think that is available to you. Uh, so the next poem I seated was um, the PM Nee Love Affair poem, which. I have to be honest, I, I don't have an analogous piece to that one. I went to the p &E for the first time in my whole life um, just a few weeks ago. And honestly, I didn't, I didn't dig it that much. Um, it made me a little queasy, the rides. Uh, so instead, um, I, I want to read you a love poem uh, that is also a love of something long ago uh, poem. And this one is called Diorama from the Greek to see through. Our basement smells like the inside of a winter hat. Sweat damp wool, clairol, scalp. Wet jeans ring off the walls of the dryers as we pass the bong between mildewed couches, feet on glass top coffee table, a strewn ashtray mesh, mess. The pot makes me cough like a jammed doorbell. I hate the way it turns water dusty and tannic, how I chew my lip to splinters no matter how many times I go for my chapstick. But that is the price of admission, 
to the museum where I can give our Teenage Tuesday afternoons the reverent attention that teachers told us to reserve for someone else's wonders. If I get high enough, I can see every smashed roach and beer can, blanket and combat boot as artifacts of an era worth careful conservation. I will marvel at all of the other, that all, that of all the other engraved zippos and secondhand amps, teenage stoners, early aughts sweaters and ugly upholstery, some curator deemed ours exemplary, brought us together in deliberate tableau. If this tendency to venerate their random crap makes me a socially weird and inexplicably emotional person to get baked with, my friends don't seem to mind. The visiting hours are loose here. I can probably even crash if I need to, so I study. Their keychains, their crushed packs of camels, someone's brother's pet lizard, for as long as it takes to find my way back on the other side of the glass. All right, checking in on my time. Um, I have a couple minutes left with you all. Um, in response to, I like to wear a turnip on my head. I'm gonna read you a poem called Real Swan Rebellion. This is from the portion of, of my book, The Problem with Solitaire, um, that is about this um, feeling that so many of us have been contending with for a long time of some sort of change, some sort of seismic shift, some sort of, you know, some like strong apocalypse vibes in the air, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, and, uh, and I think we're all responding to those feelings differently, where they impact us differently um, based on, you know, the intersections at which we start. Um, and also there's just a million ways to, <laughs> uh to to meet a global sea change um so this is one of the ways that i uh have have come to some some peaceful detente with it is writing about it a lot um and i'll offer this poem uh as as a piece of that as i said it's called real swan rebel what to make of it? The hot breath of extinction at the nape of each day, arms of the storm sweeping our table, the canter undoing itself upon the land. The flood came and there's one coming, glimmer delivered in cycle, crystal knocked across the collar of the world. Goose grease stains the wallpaper, a fleur de lis starts bleeding with the moon. There are crossed fingers breaking behind backs, television sets circled in church basements, thumbtacks tire of holding up the veil. We must know, for all the nothing that settles in between tantrums, how the clear liquor wind will shout the sky again, another blast of long lost teeth and backhand, another sudden spate of fire on the TV. There are porcupines turning themselves inside out for the sake of mercy and guns everywhere. There are children pulling ice plant from the dunes of Monterey and drones delivering the weather. It's a real swan rebellion this time. Glide and muscle squawk and great wings beating the water as alligators line up like a runway for a new engulfing. Our boat is more than half whole now. And doesn't that just make the old stigmatas buzz? All righty, um, I think I have time for, um, yeah, for one more short poem, which is perfect because RC, RC's next category was uh, one more short poem. Um, and in listening to RC's poem, it reminded me of something I once wrote, which is not a poem, but simply one of the little snippets on how many, maybe some of you have the like note on your phone or the place in your notebook where you're like, aha, a thought, a word I like, and you sort of compile things there. Um, uh, there was some cadence in R.C.'s poem of like, this is the new, that is the new this. And it reminded me that at some point in the past, I wrote down side boob is the new under boob, which is, which was the old top boob right before mid boob had its moment. Um, but so as not to go out on that exact note, I am going to read you, um, one more, uh, short and, um, uh, short and sweet poem. It's called Goose Thief. 
Small woman in a stretched shirt. Small woman in a stretched shirt, striped like she's blown through a sticky curtain of the 70s, like warm wine gums are drawn armpit to armpit across her chest, passes on Charles and snarls, mostly to me. Get your own fucking music, you Jew. I wonder how she knows. My provenance, yes, but more so about the songs I've stolen. The car horns who scream at each other like beasts across a clearing. The pocketed gosling singing under my sweater. Serrated tongue of the hard-beaked goose god in my mouth. His hisses are my dearest hatchets. His croon a silver madrigal of blade. Thank you so much to Word Vancouver for having me, for having us. Um, thank you to Brad and Right Bloody North um, and to all of you for listening. Thank you, Lucia. That was fantastic. I'm going to extend the thank yous. We've got uh, Adam running our tech. Big thank you to Adam. And we had Tim who was coordinating with us and Bonnie who was the one in contact with us who helped put all of this together and Word and everybody. Lucia, thank you again. Lots of thank yous. Um, up next, our final author of the show, Mr. Brandon Wint. Brandon Wint is an Ontario-born poet, spoken word artist, and multidisciplinary collaborator. For more than a decade, Brandon has been a sought-after touring performer and has presented his work in the United States, Australia, Lithuania, Latvia, and Jamaica. His poems and essays have been published in national anthologies, including The Great Black North, Contemporary African-Canadian Poetry, which came out with Frontenac House in 2013, and Black Writers Matter from the University of Regina Press in 2019. Divine Animal is his debut book of poetry. Put your hands together for Brandon Wint. Uh, I think you might be muted, Brandon. It's not a virtual show until somebody makes that mistake. Yes. Um, thank you, Brad. Uh, thank you to all of those who had any hand in uh, organizing what has been a lovely event so far. Uh, thank you, Lucia, for your humility, um, your desire to, um, yeah, to connect. Every time I hear you read, Lucia, I... I I get a sense of, of your sort of devotion to uh, creating community through this act of uh, poetic writing that we do. So thank you for that. And RC, thank you for your imagination. And Brad, thank you for your imagination and uh, your willingness to bring us into your biggest and best ideas. Um, so yeah, now that gratitude uh, is out of the way, I'll move towards love. Um, I like to begin uh, my readings with love because, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's just a good introduction to the things that I tend to be thinking about quite often. And so uh, this is a love poem. It is a breakup poem. It is a poem of, uh, a poem that articulates the things that, that I learned from love um, because love is foremostly a teacher. Um, and so this poem is called, I Had a Dream for Rest. I had a dream for us, a private world, fragrant as a garden, luscious as spring. I had a dream of us rising as sunflowers twinned, stems entwined like dancers' limbs, thoughtless, but for the logic of joy. I had a dream of us in a river, a strait, a channel, as water folded over us like hands, like prayer. I had a dream of us swimming, nearly naked, our bodies slick, light as seaweed. I had a dream of us praying, silent in our devotions. Our gods may be separate, but alive. I had a dream of us as cherubs, children, babies, ageless, fattened by laughter, feasting always on mirth. I had a dream where stars could not blacken, did not char our hands. You plucked the stars like fruit, fed me from their nectar. My mouth was sweet with wine, electric. I had a dream of us as drunkards, babbling like elders, like singers, like water over stones. I had a dream of us in a garden of our making. I dreamed my hands drumming the soil. 
her dream was kissing, always kissing, the soil of us, naked of smell, my hands, elegant, stained by earth, and you in the garden, fertile as spring, with me, with our mouths, planting seeds. Thank you. I mean, this is this is the, the portion where I would hope to receive applause, but I will I will affirm myself <laughs> and just imagine that uh, you enjoyed what I shared. This next poem is called Beneath the Surface. At night, a spider large and red as two wild berries struggles for hours to get to scale the curve of our bathtub before repelling blindly down the esophagus of a dream. This morning, two horseflies adhered in the straddle of lovemaking, locked in the pleasure zenith of their brief lives, let the sun drool the ridges of their backs. Even things the tiny fishnet of my intellect cannot hold are bustling with the movement of subtle affairs. Naturalists say, each tree is given a heartbeat. Every forest, a network of relations as complex as any expressed by blood. From my balcony, I glimpse the underbelly of a pigeon between rooftops and wonder whether birds, the most common of surviving dinosaurs, miss the unchallenged power of their ancestors. I remember my friend, a biologist, who recalled the startling facts that sharks are an older species than the existence of trees. And I think of the smooth, blunt head of a great white, its flash of endless teeth furrowing the cyan plain of the Atlantic. My fear is not of the shark's mouth or its primordial nose for blood, but its memory, its mastery of sunken pavilions, the dark worlds we cannot touch with our naked breath, and how little we know of why anything survives. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, reading many of these poems at a show that, that RC organized uh, the other day. And I was talking to uh, one of the audience members about, uh, yeah, sort of like my, my ethos as a performer of poetry. And I, I mentioned that for me, poetry is is a way of introducing my uh, introducing people uh, to the parts of myself that I love the most. Of course, it's also like a way of reckoning with the world. But often, when I'm sharing poetry, um, my preoccupation is with uh, inviting people into uh, the nuances of beauty as I see them. And so, this next poem called "Birthright" um, is an articulation of that, at the very least. Gulls halo the sea, adorned with off-white feathers, vermilion crown of afternoon. I mean, there is no animal too lowly to touch life's majestic head. There is no shame in fingers without rings, hands made for poetry and not kingship. I haven't had to spill blood or conquer any man outside of myself in order to press my hands against the richest parts of this world. I am not so free as to claim I am my own master, but I am, I am unbound enough in the chains we each inherit that freedom speaks to me in a voice that is song, sparrows that peel the sun out of its heavy bed each morning. I mean to say that I am alive. And the universe is mostly a cold and unknowable place. Yet somehow, I am not. This is an innocent enough miracle that my body leaves in its wake a welt of gratitude. The lips of mercy have fallen so often on my skin that I am as tender always as a bruise is to touch. I did not ask for life, yet the bewildering fold of creation opened formed a, room, a womb around the idea of me until the unlikely truth of my pulse was proof enough of purpose, worthiness, the gift of life itself. Um, 
Yeah, I might do one or two more poems. Yeah, let's say two. Um, this next poem, in a certain way, was inspired by Beyonce. Um, I won't say much more about it. <laughs> uh, it's just a poem that I like. I think it's beautiful. I hope you will too. I have heard my sisters frenzied, singing to summon Orishas to an ocean center. I have heard then joy crests like a wave, Paul sonorous, symbol the earth. I have seen the goddess open like a full sky, a celestial mouth, seen her spindle lightning to a single crackling note. Have you heard, brother, the song that melts the nightclub to honey, that slicks the walls to glistening like the labor of a thousand bees? Have you heard the trumpet moan, cry out, torch the evening red, the flute shrill with pleasure, plume the air with orgiastic witness? Do you see, sister, how a single quill of sound can read my limbs ecstatic? And what is a body but divine machinery tuned finely as a cello's bow, the pleasure's asking. Look how the goddess uses me. Look how the goddess uses me. Look how I billow with the breath of unwritten song. Sister, turn your head. How many instruments we are. Feel the room sway. Roll at our insistence like thunder through graying womb of cloud. Together, aren't we as irresistible as rain? Is heaven a symphony, an angelic gushing? Look how firmament wells with the water of our chorus. Aren't we a storm? Aren't we a storm when we move and the sky trembles? Torrents our relation. Look how the world shifts, sister. Look how the world shifts when the goddess flows. And lastly, uh, I'll end with uh, a poem that maybe is uh, the closest thing to a prayer um, that I have in the book, um, perhaps every poem of mine uh, is a prayer in a certain way because um, poems are so often articulations of uh, desires, ways of seeing and ways of being that we wish to uh, elevate into some comfort or something like love. Anyway, this poem, uh, we will say, is a prayer for my body. It's called Body Ambulance Air. Oh, body, rustle the air. Bless dandelions with your long shadow. Toss your reflected gaze into jars of honey. Offer your fingertips like figs to the mouths of lovers. Gather in your hair the ticker tape of cherry blossoms. Give your scent to water, to a river, a tincture of your held breath. In every gesture, Swim, make the chest a splintered sea. Be a moonlight, a devotion, tireless as winter. Be, if you must, a singular anthem. Soften the brutally human. Sing with the corvids instead. Body, I unleash you from mere puppetry of flesh. Unspool you, unscorn you, unmake your map of bruise. Blood and dance you, nectar you wholly, unghost you, conjure and mystique you, unmyth you, elastic your bones, luster you, encant your latent shades, mango scent you, lilac your hair, tender skin you, essential you in oils, anthem and voice you, intone you, spark you divine with songs. I untether you, body from museum of race, unchain you from treadmill of capital, release you now into fields of marigold, the archways of sunflowers bending. Body, tired animal, I fill your mouth with water, blue silky in spirals of wind. I reserve an anthem for joy, though it has no words. When I sing through my closed mouth, the song wells in my eyes, and the winged insects who sleep at midnight under porch light stretch themselves to hear. In the shadows of skyscrapers 
and the loom of blue glass towers. I stir the listless downtown avenues with an aria of footsteps, the instrument of my breath, rattling trees. I reserve an anthem, private as bedrooms, where unseeable verses tumble from my body's every gesture, and a single finger raised into the heat of my wife's waist becomes jazz. Even as I sleep and mosquitoes trouble the stillness of my face, I sing a hymn for the unseen world that holds together this human dance, my entire frame, a grateful mouth, gushing quivered notes. I wake daily into this anthem, the chorus of my life. Thank you all for listening. And uh, thank you to RC, Lucia, and Brad for uh, yeah, making this all possible. Ah, now you're muted. Ha <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Table's turn. You're still muted. Still muted. <laughs> sure. turn. You can take me to Zoom, but you can't take yeah. me to Zoom. I'm a decent lip reader, so it turned out okay. Yeah, I heard we have about two, two minutes two left. Minutes, yeah. Two minutes left yeah. here for the questions. So I've got a couple rapid. Can we get everybody back up on the screen, Adam? Okay, we're gonna throw some questions, get some quick, quick answers, and we're gonna send everybody off to have a have a great night. So, first question: What percentage? Of the poems that you've started in your life, would you say you finished? We'll go in. We can go. You can order her. Sixty percent. Sixty. I'm. I'm gonna say zero because I don't know that a poem is ever finished. Okay. Oh, wisdom. Deep. I've abandoned them, but that's different. <laughs> Brandon, you're muted now. <laughs> No, it's, it's a bit now. Uh, about 45, 45%. For me. I think that's pretty good. That's commitment. Um, who is a spoken word artist everybody watching us tonight needs to go and check out? Zoe Roy. Um, oh, man. This is the kind of thing my brain is like Rolodexing so quickly. Um I have been going back and listening to Anish Mojgani's early work, and it it's beautiful. <laughs> Fucking beautiful. Mm -hmm. Check it out if you don't know it. Brandon, uh, it's a tough one. I'm gonna I'm gonna go. Uh, Titi Shanuga, who's a right bloody author as well. Uh, Britta B. and Afua Cooper, just powerful black women who like really hold their space on stage. Oh, That's my, oh, my oh, bias. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and wow that go, it goes so fast an hour goes so fast with such great performers great company um thank you everybody who came out thank you word vancouver thank you to all the sponsors all the volunteers all the people who make this possible a free poetry festival so beautiful and uh yeah you can you can buy all our books and do all those things at rightbloodynorth.ca and uh thank you all have a have a great night. Thank you.